All right. Welcome to Geopolitical Trends. My name is David Wallalu. So good to be with you as always. And very excited to be here talking about a very, very interesting topic that, that India at the heart of this geopolitical shift, a global one that is. So I'm going to delve deeper today into that and provide you the facts and information and let you reach your own conclusion. But before I'll do that, like I always do, I'd like to extend my thanks and sincere appreciation to, appreciation to the channel's members and supporters, and to all subscribers, of course. And for you, if it's your first time here, please, please subscribe to this channel. We'll greatly appreciate your support and for you to become part of our community. I also want to take a, a, give a shout out and say thanks to a new channel's member, by the name of Bill. Bill, thank you so much for becoming a channel's member. Truly appreciate you and appreciate your support. We are now at about 42 members. So like I'm going to keep my, I keep my promise. I'm a man of my word. Once we reach the first 100, I'm going to do an exclusive Q&A for you guys, for the members and answer whatever questions you may have. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, today we're going to be talking about India. I know I'm already getting comments. I don't know if you get a chance to guys watch the video on the other channel when I where I did an analysis about why China, why India would not be a superpower. And I'm already getting comments, and I'll get to that in a minute. So, but but we're gonna be talking about today here. So, I, like I always do, I'll start with three questions just for you to think outside the box per se. Well, first question is: Is India bowing to the U.S. demands? Or is it a strategy of part of India? And second question is, can India be trusted? And third, should BRICS and SCO, the China Cooperation Organization, reconsider India's membership? So those are the three main questions and I'm going to tackle it from both geopolitical and economics. But at the same time, if you'd like to leave me answers about these questions in the chat box, that will be great, and I will take a look at that. So uh, let me let me take a look. Like always, I always like you guys to let me know where you are joining me from. And uh, oh, our Osiris, here you are, man. Thank you so much, Osiris. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you for your continued support. It means a lot. And I want you to know, and I say it in front of everybody, I don't take that for granted. It means a lot. That's to me, it's an indication of how much someone appreciates what I'm doing. Because what I'm doing, guys, it takes me time to dig into the information, sort through it, and just provide you the best of it. This way, I won't waste your time. So thank you very much, Osiris. Truly appreciate it. And uh, you guys just type in where you're joining me from. Coach Ahoy, good to have you, as always, from Malaysia. Uh, good to be here. Good to have you here. Uh, JC, good to have you in Arizona here. Good to see you, man. Uh, Raymond Lee from Vancouver. Good to have you. Uh, Jack Robert from London. Good to have you. Raymond Lee, uh, thank you very much. Excellent video on India, Doc. Uh, yeah, and I got to... I let, let me share it with you right now before I, before I move an inch. <laughs> what some... I don't like to use the term idiot, but here is what one guy wrote. The channel and the commentators are made for each other. To belittle or downgrade India, it's a, it's a show where everyone is paid. That's how stupid that is. It's because this person did not like to hear the truth. I'm not putting down India. I never put down any country for that matter. I presented the facts in that analysis on the, on what I did, when I did the video on the big channel. Those are facts. And apparently, it didn't settle well with this individual. Yeah, that, that's, and I ain't going to shy away from that. You know, I've been around long enough to know. So, so thank you so much for your uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, Raymond. I truly appreciate it. All right, let me, oh, uh, uh, Agbozo Francis from Ghana. Good to have you, man. By the way, we're going to be doing a, a show on Africa on the other channel, and I'm going to do that. So, 
All right, let me see uh, where anyone else. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy Reese from Philippines. Good to have you. Yeah, good to have you guys. I'm, I'm truly glad you are able to join in me here. So, so let's, let's get in into this topic here because there's a lot to cover, you know, and I'm not going to be tackling it from uh, uh, what I talked about in the art channel. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share uh, the link with you. You guys can, for those, <coughs> excuse me, for those who have not uh, uh, seen the video yet, I'm going to post the link for you guys here, and you can check it out later on when you have time. Uh, it's about 10, 10 or 12 minutes, whatever, but that was an analysis that I conducted the analysis for it. So so let's let's get in into our topic here. So, Well, as you may know, I, I don't know whether you know or not, some of you, that Indian prime minister... Narendra Modi was once shunned by the United States. As a matter of fact, he was denied a visa <laughs> for, for so many years, <clears throat> for over nine years or so. And this was due to, based on the reporting that was hap happening at the time, it was severe violations of religious freedoms. Now, let's just state the obvious. And again, we're not pointing fingers at India. We all know how Indian society is, is structured. A lot of multi-ethnicities, right? There are some minorities there. So I always believe that one of one among many other issues for India that he needs to deal with is its ethnic tensions. So that's that's a fact, that's reality. This is not about pointing fingers at India, whatever. It just that's how that society is. But till they sort that out, those, those issues were spread over. It's it just part of it. So, so based on this, uh, Prime Minister Modi was effectively banned from entering the United States for nearly a decade. But in the nine years since that the ban was lifted, you know, Modi has been progressively, that's the key word there, guys, progressively embraced by the White House. Now more than ever. And this is what brings me to our topic, why we're going to be talking about today. As a matter of fact, I did a recorded video, but that's separate. But here I'm going to detail the stuff in it. So, so India basically finds itself right now in an increasing dangerous world, geopolitically speaking. You know, one that is fragmenting and at the same time uh, sort of... Uh, uh, slowing down economically, you know, because the world is in transition and India will have to keep up with it. Well, how are you going to keep up with it if you don't have infrastructure, if you don't have a well-trained workforce, if you don't have uh, uh, ethnic peace? You know, there are a lot, a lot of elements involved into this, you know. And the transition in the world in which, basically, which is true that India's adversary, state and non-state, usually anytime you read this, you know what who we are referring to here in this case. It's Pakistan, you know, Pakistan's case. Because those are becoming increasingly, the state and non-states becoming a little bit more powerful, given the changes that's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So if the external world is becoming more unpredictable and uncertain, so are the internal dynamics in both entities, the state and non-state. And this is where India finds itself. It has to balance out between how to manage its domestic affairs, but also how to deal with the external world. So, so in this changing world, that becomes the sort of uh, uh, logical questions to ask is what are some of the basics and a long-term drivers for India's foreign policy? Uh, and I remember I was reading an article. Oh, let me say thank you to... Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Tabarnak. I truly appreciate you. 
they believe themselves a player but the british ended that a long time ago with the partisan of the subcontinent asean is the real rising power i couldn't agree more with you and here is the reason why also because just yesterday and i fact checked it asean issued a statement condemning the us for sending cluster bombs to ukraine yeah asean took stand so to me it's always it matters if you couldn't take stand when it matters then it's pointless and this is where i see the issue with india is india flipping back is india being flipped to the west you know once i detail with you what are what they are about to build the u.s navy that is the logistic hub that is <clears throat> so that is the reason why oh yeah i wanted to share the picture with you guys for you to see what i was referring to here in the idea of uh, how india is gonna sort of play into this foreign policy arena so when india issues statements that we are going to be a superpower that's kind of a wishful thinking because the facts do not support our argument and again, this is not about uh, putting down a country. No, 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 no. I don't get emotional on that kind of stuff when I do my assessment. Emotions aside, it's because the facts speak for themselves. The infrastructure that India needs for it to sort of uh, uh, commensurate with that status, it's not there. Simple as that. So, and this is again where you found itself how all of a sudden, uh prime minister who was shunned by the u.s all of a sudden is embraced by uh, uh the united States, the white house by this administration and the reason being also because this is part of the u.s strategic for the indo or asian pacific and i'm gonna touch briefly on that as i move forward <coughs> excuse me so that is where uh, the idea of uh, the basic and long-term uh, drivers for India's foreign policy, which in my opinion will determine the overarching goal. So what is the goal for India? Do we know? You know, saying you want to become a superpower, uh, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it in a world that is changing fundamentally. So, so becomes again another question, what is India's strategy to achieve those goals? And what should India be doing? And here is where I see what prompted me to even decide on doing this right away before. Usually I like to release the video first, then if you like me to extend on it. But I just couldn't wait because you need to know certain dynamics that is taking place as we speak. So U.S. plans, a naval logistic hub. This is it's going to be that deals with this is a, 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 an old picture, but that deals with the naval assets this is what it's going to be uh, uh in in the, in india so but the logistic hubs to india has only one objective anyway you know what it is is to counter china this is no different than what png papua new guinea okay but when i'm going to talk we talk about india now where is problematic for india is how can india embark on such uh, uh, uh tentative it's tentative you know it's not conclusive yes they agree on the uh, logistic hubs what's interesting is that uh, uh the u.s navy has already a separate deal with india right in that area i'm gonna tell you where it is all this aimed at counter in china well, at the same time if you are you india in this case at the same in the, at the same organization or within the same organization like BRICS with China, how can you be embarking on such policies? Now there are those. I saw another comment by some very very uh, how shall I say? I'm being sarcastic. Very smart person that's saying, "Oh, we shouldn't trust America. We shouldn't trust David about this because all this is a plan, part of a plan for India. India and China are coordinating." No, 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 no. They're not. They're not. Let's not pretend otherwise. They're not because the policies will justify. Do you think to this person, do you think that once the U.S. is settling in India, do you think they're going to listen to what India has to say? Forget about it, as we say. 
<laughs> you know, same difference, no different than what's going on right now in Australia. Forget about Australia now dictating the term. And soon, forget about PNG, Papua New Guinea, for them to say to America, no, 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 we're not going to do this or do that. They're going to say, shut up. We're providing you money. Keep your mouth shut and move on. That's what I see happening in India as well. And by the way, guys, I'm assuming the sound is working. So give me a thumbs up, please. So, oh, the Anna Kiblis, thank you so much for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it. So, yeah, guys, if you be kind and just give me a thumbs up. So, because I want to make sure the sound is, I learned my lesson once again. <laughs> That's usually how it works. And I'm I'm waiting to see. I know it, it, there's always a delay, uh, a delay for this to show up here. Yeah. Atin Wu, good to see you as always. Uh yeah, if you give me thumbs up, please, that the sound is working perfectly. Thumbs up. Here we go. Raymond Lee, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, so this is where the idea now. So the US seeks get this. The US seeks to transform. India into a center, of course, we're saying for only supplies, maintenance, fueling for naval vessels in the South, uh, South uh, Asia region. Yeah, uh, it goes beyond that. Didn't we think the same with South Korea? Didn't we think the same with Japan, the Philippines, Australia? So... This is where I see that challenge. And again, this prompts me to really conclude back then that when Prime Minister Modi was in the U.S., he was not invited. He was summoned. That's, that's how I see it. It's because right after I'm seeing the signs and, and I've been around long enough to understand how Washington works. I was there in Washington. I was inside. So I kind of understand how those dynamics work. So he was summoned and, of course, uh, pressed on uh, to agree on such deal. Once again, the question becomes is how can India embark on something like this while at the same time wanted to maintain its partnership, shall we say, with other members in organizations like the BRICS and the ACO? So... Here is the interesting thing, and I'm going to share a statement with you from the White House. So, and the statement reads, the U.S.-India Major Defense Partnership. Now, listen carefully. Major Defense Partnership has emerged as a pillar of global peace and security. Now, for those who say, oh, no, 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 India is playing. It just, uh, it already has a deal with China. No. Not when you have this language here. Because the U.S. Is, is embarking on it differently. By which India will have no say. Because I am telling you based on experience. Back in 2017 or 18, when we pressured India to stop buying oil from Iran, what did India do? Because we threatened to sanction them. They bowed to the U.S. and stopped importing oil from Iran. I see the same pattern. So here's the thing. The U.S. will provide India uh, with support to develop infrastructure <laughs> that will be used to supply. You know why I'm laughing. You know, anytime we say to a country, we will provide, we will support you in infrastructure when we couldn't even build our own. Do you think we're going to build infrastructure for other countries? We're going to build infrastructure over there for us, not for them. That's usually how it works. And here's the thing. We'll go along with the idea of the infrastructure. What this infrastructure is going to be used for. It's going to be used for resupply, fueling. It's going to be used for repair and maintenance of ships and aircraft. You can just see where it's going to be slowly or gradually uh, sort of uh, becoming bigger and bigger. It's no different than the same pattern in Australia and Japan and South Korea and the Philippines. So, and here is the thing, the Navy, U.S. Navy, it is close to finalizing a separate deal 
with two other ship uh, builders in in India. Those two are built. Uh, those two. Those two are headquartered in Mumbai. One in Mumbai and one in Goya. That's where it's gonna be. No. And this is why it behooves us to understand and put this within its proper context. That is. So to those who argue. Oh, there is nothing. It's just an agreement between the U.S. No, no, no. There is more into it. And again, does India know what it's getting into? I am sure it does. I am sure it does. And this is, again, where I see the geopolitical angle to it. And the geopolitical angle is this. The United States wants to use, and I use the term use in quote, you know, not, not, not. For example, you say, well, to build a partnership or no, 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 no. To use India as a key component of a coalition against China. This is what has been framed. If if you keep up with foreign policy, usually the U.S. released its uh, its uh, Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific uh, strategy. Interesting enough, if you look at the one, if you get a chance, I wish I would have pulled up the. I'll get you guys the link and I'll. I'll uh, share it on the community. I'll post it for you in the community. If you take a look at that, the one in the United States, the, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. If you look at the one in the United States, the one in Canada, the one in Germany, and the one in Australia. And to a degree, Japan. You're going to see a similar, uh, similarities in the wording. And Mike, my word on it. And Australia, by the way, Australia also, which just released its uh, strategic, uh, 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 what they call it, strategic review for 2023, by which they call in China a national threat, national security threat. So, so it's no different. That's the. So this is why the U.S. wants to use India in this. And of course, what is it for? Why do you think they want to use India for? Because they care for India? No. No, they'll sacrifice India like what we're doing right now in Europe with the whole Europe. Speaking of Europe, by the way, guys, be on the lookout. I'm going to have a conversation with Scott Ritter on Friday on the big channel. And he's going to be here on this channel as well. But but make sure to join us for that conversation. Scott and I came from almost similar background in the military. He was He was a former military intelligence. I was a former military intelligence. Except he was in the Marine, I was in the Army. So we kind of, ah. <laughs> but we, we kind of, I'm very familiar with Scott. I, I know Scott's a wonderful human being, decent. I admire the guy. You know why? Because he speaks the truth. And we tend to have it right here in our country. When somebody speaks the truth, becomes the enemy. Since when we have become that way? You know, instead of usually, usually you applaud a person like that, you reach out to a person like that for the depth and the knowledge he acquires. Instead of trying to ostracize the guy for what? I'll take him over any foreign official in the State Department. So I'll be having a great conversation with him on Friday. So here's the idea. So for the U.S. to use uh, India for the comprehensive vision. And that vision will only include sort of the military coordination. But what is the objective of it? And the objective is containment of China. Well, it's not going to work. The containment policy is doomed to fail. There is no way. By the way, there are some great analysts in Washington, D.C. There are some of them in CIA, some of them in the State Department. They are saying this containment policy is not going to work. China is not the former Soviet Union. This is a different time. And this is where I see the, the, the ill-conceived policies of India embarking on this trajectory. That is going to backfire one way or another. So here is the India's external affair minister, uh, uh, Jason Carr. Uh, when he was attending the 2023, which is this year, EU India Pacific Ministerial Forum, he said, and I quote, let me get the quote here, guys, a multipolar world is feasible only by multipolar Asia, end of quote. That is true. I agree with him on that aspect. 
but there are the other side of the arguments also and that one is when you are to explain that india's multipolar model demands an international political system where it can exercise greater agency and influence in a different strategic regions institutions and negotiations the whole objective is to achieve uh, sort of uh, uh, this goal so this is why in his opinion india has been pursuing a multi alignment or issue based alignment strategy well as a geopolitical analyst i will have to challenge that and the reason being because other country is not going to interpret that in terms of oh india is just adjusting to the new multipolar they're not going to interpret that how do you think let me just ask you this question another question but think about it this way let's say for 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 the sake of argument you are the foreign minister of one of those BRICS members beside India. How would you interpret? How would you interpret India's move right now with the US to allow for the establishment of a naval uh, logistic hub? It's called logistic hub, right? But do we know exactly what it's going to be? It's going to be beyond logistic hubs. I tell you this based on my experience. So how would you think you would be thinking? You're going to say to yourself, how come India <laughs> is a member here, but it's undermining or sabotaging or whatever term you want to use the organization. So, And this is where I disagree with the, the, uh, uh, what's, uh, the external affairs minister, uh, <clears throat> that this strategy aims to simultaneously participate and pursue India's interest in a multiple strategic and economic coalition such as the quads and BRICS, I, I, I respectfully disagree. You know, this approach that justifying the behavior of India's foreign policy in this manner, no, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it because we are seeing the example of it ourselves, especially now that we are, I give you the example of us, the United States, sending cluster bombs to Ukraine when we few years ago asked the rest of the world to ban cluster bombs how do you think it's gonna are we gonna be saying oh we're just helping ukraine and it's okay no it's not because that's double standard so what makes now any other country for that matter that trust the us regarding agreements we already broke that so we don't have any credibility left so this is where I see that problem. So having signed the new military agreement with the US, uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is moving ever closer to the West and sort of uh, further away from the East. That's the way I interpret it. So if he thinks that he's going to be playing out the Americans or the West, is mistaken. Because the U.S. already threatened to sanction India. And as we know, India will not be able to survive if we impose sanctions. i tell you this based on facts. So, so the idea that uh, uh, India is having a bid uh, to position itself as a rival superpower to China, uh, that's wishful thinking. And again, that's what I argued in my other uh, uh, analysis that I posted on the other channel. That's exactly, I presented uh, some two, three, four, four points why in the, it's just wishful thinking. It won't work. And again, for those who might disagree with me, I respect your opinion, but I'm just pre providing facts. So, so in my opinion, uh, Prime Minister Modi is playing sort of a high risk game. That's the way I see it. Because he stands firm with the U.S. and takes aim at China. Uh, and again, I'm not saying India should be scared of China. That is not what we're talking about here. You know, India can take stand, can can sort of manage itself to a degree. 
but India doesn't have the long stamina economically, logistically to manage and maintain that. So even for us, despite what you hear about this, even for us in the US, the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, let me, let me show you guys an image here because you need to see it. Where are you? Here it is, right here. Oh, I need to remove this one here. Let me remove this one from the screen. Sorry, I left that one in. I didn't see it. I didn't pay attention. If I can find it. <laughs> So the idea of uh, uh, having India thinking in terms, well, we're just going to do uh, just an agreement with, with the U.S. and it's just for, for a hubs, logistics, and, and that's about it. No, it's not going to be about that. That is the whole issue. So now with McCarthy, McCarthy himself, okay, McCarthy himself, you know what he said? Now I put it in quotes because it's his word. We, U.S., should make China and India dependent on American natural gas. That's his word, and I put it in quote. So, so what does it tell you? Right there. You know, because the plan, the president's economic plan and policies have helped create a 50-year low in unemployment and so forth. So that's why he wants to do uh, sort of uh, both China and India. So for India to be thinking, oh, the U.S. is going to do us a favor and help us out. Uh, no. So, and despite what you hear about the U.S. saying, oh, we're going to help India's massive uh, uh, manufacturing renaissance and all that, it's nonsense. India does not have the infrastructure for that. That is one of the issue. So, the, I mean, for the Speaker of the House to be saying, and this was, by the way, the statement was right before Modi, Prime Minister Modi, arrived uh, uh, in Washington uh, uh, last two weeks when he was visiting uh, the United States. To the point that we even allow him or grant him the floor on, on U.S. Congress. Because he got only about uh, like uh, three or four uh, individuals uh that spoke like churchill nelson mandela and of course comedian president zelensky that spoke to a joint session of congress so, so and this is where i see the problem that india is is i am sure they have smart people there but uh what 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 they are missing I think whomever is advising Prime Minister, I'm sure the Prime Minister Modi knows it, but it, it, it just the idea of them to be thinking that, uh, well, we're going to have uh, uh, the India relations with the US praising the significant defense and all this because it's described as sort of a unique, unique connection between the world's oldest and largest get these guys democracies <laughs> i laugh at this because in both countries those democratic rights have been abused beyond belief for us in the us we have what we call censorship we have what we call uh, government policies you know you're imposing whatever we government wants to impose okay where is the democracy into that are you i look at it no different than in our for example electoral college when we elect president why the heck electoral college will end up voting for president that i didn't choose so where is democracy into that in the india thing why the minorities do not have rights so when they use the term the world oldest and largest democracies you can just see right there and this is again what i'm trying to help you guys read between the lines the wording the wording of it because here is the thing here is the thing if prime minister modi 
thinks that the U.S. is going to just roll out the red carpet for him. He must be delusional. Why is he delusional about? Or even to think about India becoming some sort of uh, comrade in arms in some future crisis or so forth. No, he won't. Do you think we're going to care if if the if if uh, the shit hit the fans when it comes down to india's problems are we gonna go and defend india no as a matter of fact we will even ferment that further because we do have pressure points we can pressure india on certain things that's why they had to bow otherwise with just the fact we threaten them with sanctions will be enough so because here is the hard truth India, and this is again my opinion, India will never be the kind of ally that the U.S. have found in the Anglosphere, the likes of Australia, Canada, or United Kingdom for that matter. Let, let, let just, let's not pretend, okay? Let's just state it the way it is. That's the hard fact. Let me let me tackle the economic aspects of it because you need to understand the economic angle into all this. And let me see, guys, if any of you put that answer uh, to the question I asked earlier. Uh, or I can get to it later. Let me finish my conversation here and I can get to it. So the idea on the economic front is that... Uh, uh, of course, in, in the eyes of Prime Minister Modi, he sees China as the obvious logical choice to unite his country uh, with, but he's not. Because he's looking at China as a competitor. That's what prompted me to make that video in the big channel, to provide the fact about this wishful thinking of India becoming a superpower or surpassing China. It's a myth. India doesn't have, and I provided hard evidence with numbers and stats. So, so because all this is tied to economic strategy, that is. So, so because India has internal dynamics like every other country. Well, Indian nationalists, believe it or not, they see China with an advantages. Yeah, they see China with the advantages of manufacturing and the dominance its products have in the Indian market as a stunning India's own development capabilities. Because here's the thing. Le again, I'm not pointing fingers and I don't shy away from saying what it needs to be said because it needs to be said. How often do you see a product that it says made in India? Simple fact, you know. So how often do you see Global apps like GPT, like uh, 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 Chat GPT, like for example TikTok, like like I mentioned in the video. How often do we see stuff like that uh, uh, coming from India? None. So, so, and this is what Prime Minister Modi has been attempting to push, making India. Well, how can you do that if you don't have the infrastructure to support that? It's common fact. How can you do that when the poverty level is still very high? How can you do that when the income in India, the level, the poverty level, individuals live on $2.15, according to the IMF report? So, why India is saying all this? Is saying this sort of in like in a form of a campaign to woo. Attempting to woo, not even to woo, it's attempt to woo supply chain away from China. It won't work because here is the hard evidence once again. Who just left India last month? Can anybody answer me? It's a big tech company. Let me see if you guys can put the answer there. Like I always say, I like to engage you in, in a conversation. Who just left India recently and moved back to China? I'm going to see if anybody can, can answer that one. 
And again, it, it takes a while for for the answer to show up here. At the, I, I don't know why, but it is what it is. We're not going to worry about that. It's where everything is working. So, yeah, who do you think? Uh, you're right, Jojo. Scott Reader is the real deal. Yes, he is. Yeah, so who do you... Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, which company do you believe uh, uh, just left India and went back to China? And I'm trying to see if any of you guys will put the answer here because there are so many comments here. So, which is great, great to have. Uh, okay, I don't see it. I got to move on, guys, because I don't want to waste your time. You know, it was Apple. So, why did Apple move back from? Uh, moved back to China. It's because the infrastructure in India does not support Apple's objectives. So, and this is why I'm saying, if India is attempting to woo uh, supply chains away from China, it's not going to succeed. Till at least India has infrastructure that can support that. Then Western uh, uh, companies could consider, and I say could, because remember, there are labor laws and there are certain uh, working conditions and so forth. So, uh, And of course, why India is doing this? Because India had also another calculations. And this one has to do with taking advantage of Western hostility towards China. No. And this is where, again, I'm seeing, okay, if India understands this dynamics and at the same time being, let's say, in BRICS, that just doesn't make sense. And this leads me to ask you a question. And the question, pardon me, and the question is, should India be removed? Uh, no, let me take this back because that's a harsh word. Let me take this back. Should India be replaced in both? SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and BRICS. What do you guys think? Should India be replaced in both SCO and Shanghai Cooperation? So, because that's, that is a question that is coming up. I'm seeing a lot about it coming up right now. So, and the argument that, uh, again, the external uh, uh, affairs uh, minister, when the justification for China's taking this kind of stand in the multipolar world, that, that's to me when it says, for example, India is the only country in the bloc that is doing well in terms of GDP on its merit. I have to challenge that assertion. Yeah. I have to challenge that. So, because as such, the country needs no support from BRICS. Really? You know, and can survive without the new BRICS currency, it claimed. Because as you know, China challenged by saying, no, no, there is no currency. When, in fact, Russia confirmed it. So that there will be a currency that is backed by gold. And India is saying no, because India wants to push its rupees. Who's going to be trading in rupees? I mean, come on. You know, facts are facts. According to the uh, external affairs minister, why India is taking this stand? Because second point to this is that India has a good relations with the United States and Europe with trade and military deals. Uh I'll, I'll again, <laughs> I'll challenge that assertion, especially the first part, because who has the best tra trading deals? Not India, it's China and the U.S. With, the Europe, with Europe. As a matter of fact, China now is taking the lead. So, and this is once again, you know, you respect uh, their officials issue and statements, but you're going to have to challenge that. If, if the statement doesn't make sense, you got to call it out. No, you know, and again, country India in this case does not want to risk its trade with the Western power. Well, the moment we threaten the India with sanctions, if it doesn't stop 
uh, in uh, buying uh, uh, oil from Iran, all of a sudden India just bowed and did it. Hmm. And again, that leads me again to that original question. Does India belong in the ECO and in the BRICS? What do you guys think? Just leave me the answer in the chat box. And by the way, the SEO, for those who might not know, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was established in 2001, way back, to promote political, economic, and security cooperation among its members. That's, that's the reason why. And the, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's development. The development, that is, was, of course, influenced by the evolving geopolitical of the ge geo, yeah, geopolitics of the regions, and of course the the uh, interaction around the world, because we all know what happened uh, around 2001. It was 9/11 events. The world embarked on the war on terror and so forth, and the world has changed. The dynamics have changed and so forth. That was the reason why the SEO was established. So. The original idea of the SEO of articulating non-West as distinct from anti-West, two different terminologies. Non-West is very different and distinct from anti-West. So let's 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 not confuse that one, guys, because I do read sometimes a certain uh, 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 white paper where they confuse the term and use it to justify and push a specific agenda and policy. So, so, and that's the reason why. It's because the promotion of a multipolar world, that's what a CEO was intended for, you know. And, but the problem is, is that in both, in BRICS and in SEO, it's already becoming evident of the, less cohesive role of India. So, because here is the odd, especially in SEO, you have India and Pakistan joined together in 2017. Because both of them there sort of uh, expanded the SEO geographical reach, of course, and economic base, but also it brought in diversion approaches to global issues. Pakistan will have to advocate for its own. India will have to advocate for its own. And by the way, for us, we are, we can press both countries. We do have the pressure points on both countries. I don't need to tell you, I'll, I'll mention one word, Kashmir. That's all I need to say, you know, because we all know what took place in Kashmir and what still was still taking place in Kashmir. So when you look at, when you put the, as an example, the SEO under the global microscope, what you're looking at? You're looking at the organizations, uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? It's global or international position. Many wonder why India is in it. So, and again, when I'm pointing fingers at India, and I never do that, because if I got something to say, I'll say it straightforward. And you guys know me by now. That's how I operate. And I'm highlighting this fact for India. That's like what uh, the former uh, 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 leader in Singapore said. You know, you can't put India and China in the same sentence and talking about them in the same breath. It just doesn't work. The reason I'm highlighting this is for India to really zoom in at where it needs to improve. So it can become better because India has one thing that is working to its advantage is a human capital. But that human capital is useless if it doesn't have a decent environment to live in, a good infrastructure, a good healthcare system, a poverty that is still ravaging the country, a countryside that is uh, unconnected to, to modern days. So those are facts. And India needs to think about it. And this is why many are wondering about India as a role inside the SEO and now BRICS. So, uh, because here's the thing, when you think about it, the SEO 
uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization supports the non-proliferation. Because what does India and Pakistan have? Nuclear. Nuclear, nuclear weapons. So. And the support, ACO support the non-proliferation treaty from which India and Pakistan have stayed away. Every member except India. So every member except India participates in China's BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Once again, was India shooting itself in the foot by not embarking on some project, infrastructure project that could uplift the country, economically speaking? And again, I'm just talking logically here. I'm not pointing fingers at India, and I will never do that because there's no reason to do so. so. Yeah, let me see your answers, guys. What? Uh... Oh, TNT, thank you so much for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it. You wrote, India will only isolate themselves from Russia, their staunch ally, and move them towards isolation from the rising power, which is the East. I couldn't agree more with you, TNT. Spot on. And it's fact. It's factual. It's factual. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, again, brought uh, back to the fore the question of how you, uh, in India in this case, can you embark on something while at the same, embark on policy like that for allowing the establishments of uh, naval hubs, which starts like that. Later on, it will turn into a naval base. Uh then all of a sudden you are with BRICS, with Russia and China. And it just doesn't make sense. And it's going to become, it's going to come time when I think the members will have to confront that reality. I don't know what BRICS and SCO mechanism is for asking a country to leave or remove the country. I don't know the mechanisms for that. And, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to take a look at it because I need to know. I need to educate myself on that because it will be important. The reason it will be important for me is because what I'm seeing coming as far as the enlargements of BRICS. But if India is the weak link, it's going to drag. It's going to drag the organizations from reaching its objectives or its goal or its full potentials for that matter. So that, that's the way I see it. So, so I hope, and again, Nothing against India. I'm pointing fact. Uh, if, if you get a chance to watch the video, I posted the link for you. Just look it up on the other channel. Uh, and listen to that analysis. I did. It's 12 minutes. It's not that long. But it's sp strictly to the point. So, And of course, I will always, always welcome your feedback and thoughts and, and, and comments and disagreements and all that. Because we're here to learn. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn. So. All right, guys, let me see if there's one question and I'm going to sign off because I have an interview in Washington, D.C. that I need to get to. And, uh, and uh, by the way, be on the lookout for a video uh, soon about uh, one European leader that took stand against the EU. You'll be surprised who that leader is. So, And again, remember, I'll be having a conversation with Scott Ritter on Friday on the other channel, but I will have him on this channel as well. You know, he's a busy person and I'm very respectful of his time, but uh, you do not want to miss that conversation. As I said, again, we both from came from a military, military intelligence that is. So we got a quite a lot to talk about. So, all right, let me see if there's any question here, guys. And um, if not, I'm going to have to leave it at that. Oh, lovers of the Russian team. Thank you so much for your super sticker. Uh, I do appreciate all of you. I want you to know, guys, I don't take it for granted. Never, ever. So it means a lot. And just for the channel's members, if you if you want to become a member, please just join that so we can reach that 100 number and I can do an exclusive Q&A where I will answer just your questions. I am not going to do any talk whatsoever. It just will be a session for the members and we'll talk. If it needs to be three hours, I'll stay there for three hours. Doesn't matter. So 
So thank you so much for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it. All right, let me. I'm looking, guys, to see if there is any question. And if not, I'm going to sign off and I look forward to seeing you next time. All right. And. All right, let's see. Question from Jack Robert because that's what shows up here in front of me. Uh, Jack wrote, How can India think stopping China will help them become the first class superpower when the US is stopping the ambitions of China? Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> well, it, it's that's a great question, Jack. And, and and I can only answer this one way, not not in a sarcastic way or putting India down, but could India have not sort of free itself from its colonial era, psychologically speaking? What do you think? Like we said, as I said, when I used to live in Washington, you know, and there is the sign in the Pentagon that says, hope is not a strategy. It's not a plan. So this wishful thinking, it, it, it's going to have to stop at some point because it's only India putting itself in a bad position, credibility-wise. Because now you hear uh, people saying, oh, India is a superpower. It, it, it's laughable. Come on, let's let's stop. Let's stop and not pretend. State the fact for what they are. You know, India will be no match to China economically. That that that's just kind of sense. So, and and infrastructure-wise, how can you compare China to India or India to China? You know, yes, I did put on the other channel the title because I wanted to provide a framework to put things in perspective. It wasn't meant to be to compare. You know, we all know this. It's no, it's no, it's no uh, secret. It's not a mystery. You can't compare India to China. It just doesn't work. Even here in the West, most of the white paper that I read when it comes down to the Chinese economy, I always say the second largest. When we all know, it's soon over is going to overtake that of the U.S. It's because words do matter. That's how we. If we want to escalate or soften the blow, that is. In this case, to soften the blow is saying, oh, the second largest economy. When we know we depend on Chinese market, plain and simple. So, so you're absolutely correct, Jack. I just don't see how uh, India is going to, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Till they free themselves, first of all, from that kind of thinking. And second... They're going to have to uh, uh, build their infrastructure because that is the key. That is the key for what India needs to do. So, Anyway, guys, I hope you find this very informative and I look forward to seeing you next time. As always, remember, geopolitics impact your daily life in more ways than one. Till next time, guys. Bye-bye.